Well, thank you very much to, to Jamie and, uh, and the speakers who contributed to such a rich discussion in the previous session. Plenty of food for thought in this session where we want to widen up the conversation, open up the conversation, drill into some of what you heard yesterday, yesterday earlier, from uh, those institutional voices, bring some voices in from the outside, including your own. We're very keen to have audience participation in this, in this session. And uh, you may have seen behind Jamie during the previous session the work of our in-house cartoonist, Tonu, um, and uh, his uh, characterizations of some of what we were hearing in the previous session. I was really struck by the, the cartoon that showed a couple in a bed and basically relationship status, it's complicated, EU, NATO. So what I would like to drill into in this session is just how complicated is it? Does it have to be that complicated? Can it be less complicated? And what are the ways forward in terms of less complications in the in the, the relationship. We have some great speakers uh, with us today. Unfortunately, uh, John J. Sullivan, the US ambassador to Russia, cannot be with us after all. But we are going to begin uh, with Kade Silde, who is the Estonian Under Secretary for Depen Defense Policy. And uh, Kadi will speak for five minutes in terms of this conversation, what you heard in the earlier session, Kadi, from the perspective of Tallinn. Thank you very much. Uh, lovely to be here. Uh, uh, thank you for having me. Um, I'll touch upon quite a lot of the themes that were discussed in the uh, in the earlier session as well. But uh, but uh, as you said, I'll do it from the perspective of uh, of Tallinn, uh, from the perspective of a country uh, that uh, is from a rather difficult geopolitical situation. Uh, uh, situation. Um, so for us. Uh, Joining NATO and joining EU were, were always both uh, um, a security project. Joining the EU was never just an economic uh, a project for us, uh, given the situation that we were in. And of course, uh, EU-NATO cooperation, uh, EU-NATO cooperation as security providers is incredibly important for us. Um, in terms of um, how the cooperation between the two organizations uh, uh, should go forward, um, then we uh, we firmly believe that uh, that uh, the framework that we need is there. Um, uh, the preconditions uh, of cooperating are there. Uh, we don't need any new frameworks. Uh, and of course, um, uh, having declarations, uh, you know, having a new EU-NATO declaration is um, is uh, is very positive. Um, it is especially important uh, today when we look at what is unfolding uh, uh, on the borders of uh, Poland, uh, Latvia and Lithuania that are faced with a brutal hybrid attack by the Lukashenko regime every day. Uh, we see that uh, uh, sending a sign of, of us being united is important. But more importantly, uh, we also see a clear need for NATO and EU cooperation uh, uh, to respond effectively to the sort of crisis that we are seeing. Uh, it, is, it is clear that, uh, that uh, you know, smart adversaries don't just pick military tools or civilian tools. They, they pick uh, uh, sort of a, a mix of tools. Uh, and, we, uh, and we, as West, uh, need to adapt ourselves to, to, to these sort of challenges. And, and uh, expanding uh, and strengthening and deepening EU-NATO cooperation is, is the way to go. Um, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, um, a division of labor, um, as, as, as uh, uh, last speakers said, um, it's, it's an idea that, uh, that many entertain, uh, but at the end of the day, it's not doable. Uh, if Estonia alone um, wrote the new strategic concept, of course, we would be very happy with, you know, saying uh, NATO will do collective defense uh, and the rest, you know, can be done with by, by someone else, by, by another organization. But the truth is Estonia on its own will not write the strategic concept. Uh, and uh, the value of NATO uh, has to remain high for each and every member state, uh, for each and every ally. 
um, you know, the question of China is something that, uh, that uh, uh, has created a lot of debates in this town and in all capitals, a question of whether NATO is really the right tool to deal with China. And it's a fair question. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, you know, for the U.S. to be less interested in NATO, it doesn't take, uh, you know, Donald Trump style will leave NATO. Uh, uh, the U.S. just seeing NATO as less um, uh, less uh, relevant for its security mm -hmm. concerns is is uh, is is the main worry. So NATO will deal with China, even though the EU might be a better tool with it because NATO wants to be relevant for all its member states. Um, and, there's, um, and this sort of overlap uh, exists in, in, in many other areas. I mean, resilience was, was mentioned, uh, uh, cyber, um, hybrid in general, um, EDTs, uh, emerging and disruptive technologies, uh, etc. cetera. Um, and this, this overlap is not a problem. Um, having said that, um, of course, there are uh, there are certain areas where one or the other organization is better. Uh, of course, NATO will take and continue to take care of collective defense. Uh, but what we see perhaps as the main uh, value of the EU as a security provider is, um, is its sort of wide whole of government, whole of society toolbox. Mm -hmm. um, and again, this is, this is incredibly uh, important also in the, uh, in, the, uh, 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 in the context of this ongoing, uh, ongoing crisis to the east of, to the east of Europe. Um, and uh, I'd mention another point of sort of overlap. Um, there's this, um, uh, what I'd call imperfect overlap, of course, between, uh, between the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, member states of both of these organizations. Uh, but it's, but it's and, and I don't deny that, and no one would deny that there are political problems, there are political challenges, um, but, uh, but it's also sometimes overemphasized. I mean, first of all, if we look at the numbers, um, 20, 21 EU member states are in NATO, uh, 21 uh, NATO allies are in the EU. So it's, it's an imperfect overlap, but it's 75%, so it's still pretty good. Uh, and in terms of how NATO, for example, uh, non-NATO non EU, uh, uh, Member states are are involved in uh, in um, in different NATO frameworks, uh, such as uh, the Partnership for Peace program or uh, Enhanced Opportunity Partners. Then again, uh, while there is an imperfect overlap, uh, uh, the the conditions are really there to 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 push this cooperation forward. Thank you very much. It, it's you know it's striking what you say because I'm originally from Ireland, so I know how the conversations on this kind of uh, evolve when when the subject comes up in in Ireland. But in terms of as you mentioned, six uh, EU member states are not in NATO. How do you think that will affect the prospects for further collaboration? How does that inform? How will that inform the conversation going forward? As I said, the the. Uh the conditions for cooperation uh, are there. Uh, we are we are uh, incredibly deeply involved. Uh, 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 in, in, I mean, the non-members are incredibly deeply involved. I mean, sometimes we joke uh, in our region that our our close neighbor Finland finds out about some things happening in in NATO before we do. So, so I think this this uh, this sort of uh, uh, um, imperfect overlap is 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 really overstated quite quite often. Uh, and while we need to be conscious uh, of the political uh, sensitivities, uh, uh, sometimes it's used as an um, as a, uh, uh, it's used to, to 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 sort of not do something that that could actually be done as an excuse. Now, NATO is traditionally focused on challenges in mm. Europe's northeastern mm. um, neighborhood. Uh, Increasingly, it's focused on the southern rim, Europe's yeah. southern rim. From your perspective as an Estonian, how do you balance those two? Yeah. And in terms of the Mediterranean dynamics yeah. and the increased interest and challenges coming yeah. from the Mediterranean, yeah. what does that look like from talent? Yeah. Um, well, um, uh, first of all, our 
um, all of our international missions um, from Estonian point of view, Estonian participation in international missions are, um, are to the south. Uh, our biggest contribution is in Mali. Um, uh, we're both there. We're there both with the French uh, in the EU mission, in the UN mission, and we were the first to join uh, 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 the French there uh, in their uh, Barkhane mission. So, so we uh, uh, we see the need to to uh, uh, to contribute there. Uh, but again, in terms of through which organization you do it, I don't think that's all that important. Uh, uh, I mean. Let's face it, the EU is a bit better equipped to deal with, uh, with the challenges coming from the south, be it, uh, be it uh, uh, migration uh, uh, issues, I mean, sort of the root, the root causes of uh, uh, all the challenges from the south. So, um, uh, so while the EU might be doing more um, in the south, perhaps, than, than, the NATO, uh, than NATO is, because it's better equipped to do that, um, I, don't, I don't see that um, as a problem. Quite the opposite. It it just uh, uh, shows the need. Uh, uh, it just shows that the two organisations are complementary. Thank you very much, uh, Kadi. We'll turn now to our next speaker who joins us online. It's João Gomes Cravino, the Minister of National Defence of of Portugal. Good afternoon, Minister. Good afternoon. So if we could start off um, by asking you, what do you think are the emerging challenges that uh, NATO and the EU face together? And how do you see the likelihood of further cooperation and how that cooperation will evolve? Okay, thank you. Well, firstly, uh, it's great to be with you. Congratulations to Friends of Europe for uh, setting up a, a great program. I wish I could be with you in person, but uh, it's, uh, it's uh, almost as good to be online. And uh, so, pleasure also to join uh, Kadi uh, Silda and Tanya Letizia, and of course, uh, our moderator, Mary Fitzgerald. Um, I think that uh, uh, I, I would subscribe to a very large amount of what has uh, previously been said. And that's, I think, interesting in itself because Cadi is coming from the far northeast of the NATO region and the European Union, um, and I'm coming from the far southwest. And I think that over the past three years in which I've been defense minister, I've seen an enormous convergence of, uh, of points of view. I think that uh, the, nowadays we have to be aware that uh, collective security is really only the tip of our security iceberg. Underneath that, there are many other factors that have an impact upon security, upon our security, and which uh, would, not, uh, would not make sense to invoke Article 5 of the Atlantic Charter, for example. Um, and uh, these are the numerous areas in which EU-NATO collaboration, I think, has to go further and, and deeper. A few examples, uh, emerging disruptive technologies. Uh, I think that the European Union has a number of very, very significant instruments, and it's fundamental that together we should be working in order to develop our uh, standards on that, to ensure interoperability, to uh, map out before others do it, the impacts that uh, that emerging disruptive technologies can have on our military capacity and indeed on our civil societies. Um, responding to hybrid threats. Now, uh, of course, it's very much in the forefront of our minds what's happening on the border between Belarus and, and Poland and also Lithuania and Latvia right there. It, this is very much in our minds, but how could we simply with NATO instruments deal with this issue. It would be difficult. And therefore, and yet this is, without any doubt, also a security challenge for us. I think that the range of hybrid challenges require us, in many cases, to say we need to go further and deeper in EU-NATO cooperation in order to be able to be properly equipped uh, to, to deal with these challenges. It doesn't make sense for us to be separated in our different silos particularly, as Gadi has pointed out, 21 out of uh, uh, 27 members of the European Union are also members of NATO, 21 out of 30, 30 uh, allies in NATO. We have all of the challenges relating to climate change. 
which the European Union is more well equipped as a NATO to deal with. So the value added of the European Union is, uh, is, is very palpable in many of the most important spheres that have a direct impact upon our security concerns. Maritime security is another. You know, we're all aware about the amount of uh, trade. 90% of our trade goes through, over the, so along, through the sea, but 90% of our digital communications that are fueling our digital economy also go under the seabed. And how do we protect uh, that, uh, that, that, that infrastructure? These are issues where we need NATO and the EU to collaborate more closely. But I think that we've got to the point now where this has been clearly mapped out in, in, in many of our minds and uh, identified as areas where we can work together. What's missing? I think there's one thing that's missing, which is to get beyond, to go beyond this uh, metaphysical division that we have and that's resulted over several years of misconversations uh, between NATO and the European Union regarding strategic autonomy. And uh, I think we've got to the point now where we can take the step forward. The joint declaration that uh, we've been uh, thinking about between NATO and the EU, I think would be the appropriate moment to say we now need to move to a different level of intensity of our cooperation. This is the moment now that we are each uh, in NATO writing this new strategic concept in the European Union, writing the strategic compass. Now that we are writing up these um, documents that are going to uh, chart the path for the next uh, few years, this is the right moment to have a joint declaration to say we really should be doing much more and, and we can do so much more. The uh, declaration, the US-France declaration at the end of uh, September and the second one at the end of October uh, give us the language and the spirit that we need to, to go further down this path. Thank you, Minister. In the earlier session, Molly Montgomery from the State Department talked about the need to raise the level of ambition, as she put it. This week, around the launch of the EU Strategic Compass Blueprint, we've seen a lot of discussion again about the gap between ambition and realities in Europe. Realities in terms of capabilities, but also willingness of different uh, member states. Do you think Europe is up to the challenge? To raise well, the level of, course, of ambition? Europe is um, the European Union and the 27 member states of the European Union. And uh, I think that there is a growing recognition uh, that, if you allow me, I know it's, uh, it's not, 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 not really the, the done thing, but to quote myself, mm -hmm. to say that it is really, at this point, it's not realistic not to be ambitious. If we are to be minimally realistic uh, about the challenges that we face, we actually have to be ambitious in the European Union. And of course, we have to uh, fulfill what our, uh, what, what our commitments are. But I think that all of this has become easier in the past number of months with the growing uh, recognition that uh, in NATO, there is not an opposition to uh, the intensification of a European defense identity and uh, the growing understanding that uh, in the European Union is never going to be able to offer the collective security guarantee that we have in NATO. I think that now that we're getting beyond those, uh, those, those, those bugbears that have inhibited uh, dialogue and prosperous dialogue between the EU and NATO in the last few years, I think that the, uh, the moment is right. There is also, I think, an enormous awareness now, including in our public opinions, that the comfortable age uh, that we lived through over several decades has really come to an end, and that the uh, security threats that we face are, are real, they're palpable. And um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, collective security through NATO is not the solution to all of the challenges that we face, so we have to have the capacity to respond in other manners, including through the European Union. Very quickly then, Minister, your thoughts on how you balance the challenges from uh, emanating from Europe's northeast with the challenges emanating from its southern rim, and where, in terms of NATO, and how EU cooperation can play into that? <laughs> Yes, I mean, I think that for many of us who are members of both uh, 
European Union and NATO, um, we, we have a, an integrated approach. You know, I'm uh, going to be visiting shortly our F-16s that are in Lithuania doing Baltic uh, air policing. Um, and uh, at the same time, uh, I shall also be visiting shortly uh, troops that we have in, in Mali, Central African Republic, and so on. So I think that the notion of 360 degree security is one that has really um, gained traction in the last uh, few years. And uh, what Kadi has said about Estonia's attitude is, is, uh, is a very good example of, of that. So uh, we, we have a clear understanding, I believe, that whether it's through NATO or through the European Union training missions, or even through uh, United Nations missions in some cases, we have to be security uh, providers. We all have to be generating liquid security for a very disturbed world that we have around us. And that happens in, in all 360 degrees. Thank you, Minister. I know you're staying with us for the for the Q&A, but before that, we'll turn to our third speaker, uh, Tanya Letici, who is the co-lead of the NATO 2030 Young Leaders and a security and defense expert at the European External Action Service. Uh, Tanya, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Well, tough act to follow after the uh, these two eminent speakers, so thanks for not making it uh, easy. Um, you've given me five minutes to touch upon really big questions that you've posed uh, via an email, so I'll better spend them well. I'll make three quick points in these five minutes. First, on strategic autonomy. I remember it, this was specific, it was a very famous uh, request. Then on NATO, and then on what's to come, a bit of a forward-looking uh, vision since the, the, the summit is called strategic foresight. So first, on strategic autonomy. What does strategic autonomy mean? This has become almost a Shakespearean type of, of question. Uh, to be or not to be strategically autonomous? Is thy strategic autonomy against or for someone? Is, why does thee seek a strategic type of autonomy? Now, Shakespeare aside, I think these are valid questions. And while words do matter, my impression is that Often in the strategic autonomy debate, we tend to focus more on concepts than on action. And at the end of the day, when I look at our degrading security environment, which I think many speakers have, uh, have mentioned this, I think it's a common agreement, it's there, it's degrading. When we look at that, I think action deserves more attention than, uh, than semantics at this point. Now, whatever we choose to call it, the crux is that the EU wants to take more responsibility for its security, as simple as that. And more importantly, perhaps for our panel, and as was emphasized in the previous panel, it aims to do so by working closer with NATO and the United States. And that is unequivocal. And this is also very strongly reflected in the strategic uh, compass, which I'm sure you've all seen because it was leaked. <laughs> so uh, then you, you know that I'm not just uh, messing around. It's very strongly reflected in there. Now, concretely, no matter, I think, on what side of this debate you place yourself, I simply don't think we can afford to have a weak Europe in security and defense when around us we see things such as the American push to complete the pivot to Asia, one coup after another to our south, or, as was mentioned, rightly so, ongoing blatant hybrid attacks and the instrumentalization of people to our east. We cannot afford that. Everyone expects Europe to act, and to react. If we open Twitter, and if we look at the comments and at the tweets, everyone is asking, what is the EU going to do about this? And yes, rightly so, what is the EU going to do about this? So that should be the focus when we talk about strategic autonomy. How can we better empower the EU to respond to crises that affect its vital interests? That was briefly my first point. Second point, NATO. Where does NATO fit in this equation? We've talked about this in the previous panel, and EU-NATO cooperation has a long history, which I love to talk about, but I won't uh, take you through that, don't worry. Um, but it's a history that hasn't always been one of close cooperation, let's be honest. It still is a history that since 2016 keeps beating its own record of how close the partnership is becoming. And in some ways, I think this has been quite a natural development, which, by the way, interestingly enough, began to flourish during the Trump presidency, when we know that EU-US contacts were rather limited and we know there was a, a special relationship with, uh, with NATO that, uh, that Trump had. 
And to explain EU-NATO relations, um, those who know me know as well, I often uh, un rather unconventionally tend to compare them to street cats. And these are cats who even though they share a physical territory in Brussels, right, different sides of Brussels, for most of their history, they were happy to cohabitate under a silent agreement that as long as each of them stays in their physical and also conceptual turf, then everything is fine, while of course uh, sharing uh, suspicious glances from, uh, from different sides of Brussels. I think this changed when they realized, simply put, that those actors that surround their shared uh, neighborhood tend to be the same, they tend to target more or less the same things, and that yes, they have a much better chance at facing them if they join forces and combine their, their instruments. So now, when we no longer only speak about traditional defense and deterrence when we talk about what is needed for European security, but we also talk about things from crisis management, resilience, emerging technologies, tackling the effects of climate change, and the list goes on and on. It is very clear that NATO needs the EU as much as NATO, as much as the EU needs NATO. That's, that's absolutely clear, because if the EU is not strong and is not resilient, neither will NATO. That is simply how interconnected uh, we are. And on a less abstract note, perhaps, because this was asked, I think, in the previous panel, and as someone who joined the EAS recently and who used to work on EU-NATO relations, but from more or less the outside, I can happily report that I was really impressed to see from the inside how close the contexts are and how, um, how much my colleagues work to keep in touch on a day-to-day -day basis and to keep uh, regular contacts. The EAS has even inaugurated an EU-NATO task force uh, this October to better magnify uh, our work on EU-NATO cooperation, which keeps increasing and increasing, which is good news. And you, you talked about uh, relationship uh, status. Uh, I think the relationship status at the moment is that the 2016 honeymoon is over, but now it's time to actually work to, on the relationship. That was my point on NATO. Final point, what's to come? I think that if we study the threat analysis, which is confidential, so we can't, but I can tell you, if we study the threat analysis that the EU did last year for the very first time, What's to come is probably more of what we already see unfolding today. A more crowded and contested strategic theater, more intense geopolitical competition, and more challenges to rules-based rules multilateralism. This means clearly that we need to step up our game. And there's no better time than the present, I think, to do that since obviously both the EU and NATO are in full-on strategic reflection mode uh, and even their two processes share an acronym, the SC, not confusing uh, at all. But still, for the, for the strategic compass, it was already uh, talked about by, by one of my bosses, so I won't go into that. But I think we just shouldn't expect it to, you know, magically fix uh, all our problems. It's certainly not a silver bullet, but I do think it is a silver lining. It's something to look forward to. And as we are now in full swing with the strategic compass and with the strategic concept respectively on the, on the NATO side, I would encourage us to be the optimist. In the joke where the pessimist says things can't possibly get any worse and the optimist says, oh yes, they can. So let us be the optimist and let us be very clear-eyed about what is ahead of us. So let me stop here. Thank you very much, uh, Tanya. And to move away slightly from your note of, of optimism at the end there, before we go to Q&A, I would like to ask a question of both Zhao and Kadi. And that is, I noticed when I asked you both about the um, dynamics in Europe's southern rim, that you both spoke about the Sahel, Mali, etc. Not so much about the Mediterranean. I have particular interest because I work on, on Libya. The Slovenian defense uh, minister earlier this week, responding to the discussions about the EU strategic compass, talked about the need from their perspective of a fine tuning, as he put it, on Russia and the Mediterranean. We all know when we talk about the Mediterranean, we're talking about one particular country in particular, and that is Turkey. So a question to you, Kadi, and you, Zhao, where does Turkey fit into this conversation when it comes to cooperation between NATO and the EU, given the issues we're all aware of, given the, you know, the fact that people talk about the Mediterranean, even naming Turkey seems to be something that people are not willing to do. Kadi. 
Uh, yes, that's uh, that's one of the toughest uh, toughest questions to get. Uh, I mean, I won't sit here and say there's there are no issues. Obviously, uh, that is the that is the political difficulty that I refer to uh, uh, in my opening uh, opening statements. But um, uh, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, from our point of view, uh, um, we think Europe as such is stronger if Turkey is you know allied with. European powers uh, rather than uh, than uh, allied against us. So uh, so uh, we 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 find it very very unfortunate that there are these sort of uh, uh, these sort of uh, uh, difficulties and and differences between uh, between allies. Uh, mm. But uh, but we also uh, see no other way out than to rather try to solve them uh, and come closer there rather than to just push push each other um, further away. Thank you, Kadi. Jean? Uh, it is a, it's a difficult challenge that we're all facing. Firstly, uh, Turkey is a fundamental geopolitical ally for, uh, for, for NATO. This is, uh, there's no doubt about it. Imagining a NATO without Turkey, um, one could very easily see the, the massive problems that could arise from this. But at the same time, it's, it's very clear that there has been a democratic degradation in Turkey over a number of years, and that this democratic degradation has had a direct impact on the degradation of the geopolitical role played by Turkey. I think that uh, NATO is a fundamental platform for dialogue and for convergence, that we need to have strategic patience in dealing with an ally who is going through a difficult internal time. I think that once, the, and sooner or later, uh, the uh, political situation inside Turkey will begin to improve again, again in the sense of uh, returning to democratic norms, and then we will have a Turkey that is also playing a much more constructive geopolitical role. So this is uh, the, the way that I put it at the moment. I don't think that Turkey's behavior in the Mediterranean is the result of uh, fundamental deep-seated interests in Turkey's side. I think it's uh, just a reflection of the political context that the country is going through at the moment. And so we need to live through this. We need to be able to work with what is possible to, to, to work with, with with respect to Turkey and uh, and to help uh, the country return to democratic norms that are, that are present in the rest of NATO allies. Thank you very much. Um, so with that, we're going to open up the discussion the, to those of you who are with us in the room, but also those of you joining us online. Um, if you have a question, could you please raise your hand, those of us in the room? Alejandro, my colleague, will be um, basically taking in the request from online. And we already have some requests, Alejandro? Okay, great. Let's go to online then for our first question. Uh, yes, indeed. We do have uh, this one question from, from Martin Rabe from De Morgen. Um, and uh, Mr. Rabe is asking, uh, to reach real strategic autonomy, is there not a need for both NATO and the EU to regain technological and industrial independence again? Uh, think of semiconductors production, very important for our technological hardware. But a lot of them are produced in China, which is now defined as a common threat. How vulnerable are our supply lines there? Do the speakers see uh, more collaboration possible there between the, U the US and the EU, uh, despite separal, separate national interests and healthy competition? This is what we have for now. Thank you. Let's take questions in batches of three. Anybody in the room with a question? Yes. If you could stand up, please, when you're asking the question. The mic will, there's a rubbing mic. Thank you very much. Uh, in keeping with my previous things I had, I have a comment on the question. The first comment is, I think, it, just to underline that it is important. Uh, we're hearing from the speakers that it is not a division of labor between collective defense and, uh, and crisis management, but it's a continuum of threats that needs to be met with a continuum of instrument, and that's also important because um, there is also a blind spot in the conversation, which is what member states and allies are doing at a national level or in other formats, minilateral formats. Uh, and that is something we need to take into account. My question is that we're hearing a lot of convergence between the speakers to, in this session and the previous one. And so are we all good? Why isn't, aren't we moving forward? Why would we need to move forward mm -hmm. on EU-NATO cooperation and on making Europe more able to, uh, to act? 
Thank you very much. Any other questions in the room? Yes, this gentleman here. Thank you. Um, answer to the young colleague who mentioned why, why is it NATO and, and you are the same, uh, like two different, uh, two cats in the same thing, because they are very different cats. I mean, the security environment is full of predators. And if you've got to confront them, then you must have the proper tools to do that. So, you know, we've been having a very, very nice conversation. It's, it's really good to hear so much agreement and so on. <laughs> Uh, but the truth of the matter is, and it's, it's a pity that one or two questions posed by the former Secretary General, Yavad Hoops Hefe, were not answered. Uh, this proliferation of priorities, etc., you've got to decide at some point. And my question, therefore, is I mean, <laughs> I could offer my answer, I think, at the moment that's just not happening. If strategic compass is going to be successful and has any meaning, it has to have first the proper uh, threat assessment or at least an alignment, if not an agreement. I don't see it, and it's no time to go into the actual situations happening in the real world, which do not show that much solidarity. Do you solidarity. have a question for us? The question is how realistic okay. the, the speakers believe that it will be actually, uh, in spite of what we heard today, to arrive at such an agreement or even an alignment of the security threat assessment. Uh, Robert Stelder former NATO, now the Puaski Foundation. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Tanya, we'll turn to you first in terms of those three questions we've just heard. Not uh, challenging at all. Thank <laughs> you. Um, well, first of all, on technological sovereignty, I think um, the person who asked that question should probably wait for the next panel because it will be focused very much, uh, very much on that. But and that's not certainly not my area of expertise, but as someone who, who reads the news on a daily basis, obviously uh, cr critical technologies and our critical infrastructure and, and foreign direct investment screening and all these things have become very much on the, have, have become much higher on the political agenda. And obviously COVID-19 had something uh, to do with that. It has deeply exposed our, our vulnerabilities. It has uh, exposed our strategic dependencies. And I think there's a lot of work, at least on the, on the EU side, but not only on the EU side being, being done on that. And I think part of the work that is being done on that, um, or, or testament to that work, is the fact that NATO now is paying a lot of attention to these, uh, to these very topics. So I'll, I'll, of, of course we need to work there. And it's very much a topic uh, of the EU-US uh, TTC, again, proving that there is a need for transatlantic alignment on these big questions, and it is very much a topic for uh, the EU and NATO to discuss. That was briefly on, uh, on the first uh, question. Now, on, the, on Olivier's question and the, and the third question from, uh, I, I, I guess, an older <laughs> audience member, since I was characterized as the younger uh, speaker, uh, are more or less um, uh, similar. So, on this, I would say that, you know, just, our, just as our security environment evolves, our instruments and our action evolves uh, as well. Ten years ago, we wouldn't have been able to imagine all the progress that we have done on one area, military mobility, for example, on, on EU -NATO, uh, in the EU-NATO relationship. Ten years ago, as little as that, even for a young person. Uh, so, who knows what's to come? I think this dangerous world is certainly our oyster when it comes to EU-NATO cooperation. So, even though I, I, I tend to be a pessimistic uh, Romanian in my day-to-day -day li day -day life, I think uh, here I tend to be uh, quite optimistic in looking at how, what we have achieved uh, in quite a, a short amount of, uh, of time. And, of course, what the EU is doing under the banner of what some people call strategic autonomy, strategic responsibility, strategic sovereignty, whatever you want to call it, of course this feeds into NATO 2030 and, and into NATO's work. And we heard this from, from Benedetta herself in the previous panel, um, because NATO itself is looking at tackling challenges where clearly EU's instruments are much more needed than, than the ones that NATO presently has. So, as I, I said in my, I will also quote myself since it's fashionable. Um, if the EU is not uh, strong and resilient, neither will NATO. Um, yes, so that was, I think, on the first uh, part. Yeah, I'll stop there. 
Tanya, just before I, I turn to Kadi and Zhao, just not to harp on about the generational aspect of it, but in the conversations that you're part of, mm. do you see a generational component to this in terms of differences? We heard Benedict earlier talking about we're living in a game changer era. The threats are evolving, new threats, et cetera, new challenges. Do you think there is a generational difference in these conversations? I think what I've learned in, in, in doing the, the NATO 2030 Young Leaders Report, which, which I had the, the honor really to, to co-lead together with a, a fantastic group, is that our generation tends to emphasize much more how what we see as security and defense, how this has broadened much more how it's not just, and I briefly touched upon this, it's not just traditional defense and deterrence. We very much recognize that this remains important. We are not, you know, not everyone is a, is a tree-hugging millennial that wants to ban nukes. It's not, it's, not, it's not as simplistic as that. But we just think it's much more complex than that. There are many more layers added to what security uh, means and to what our security means. And then if we go into the area of resilience and what could be done there, that's where I think um, my generation uh, really wants to see an emphasis on. Everything that we do on cyber, everything that we do on secure communications, on disinformation, all these areas, they feed into a much wider continuum of threats. So that's what I'd say. Thank you, Tanya. Kadi. Uh, thanks. Uh, are we all good? Uh, God, no. Uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, there are a lot of incredibly difficult conversations, and, and the one on strategic autonomy has been one of them. Uh, you know, you, you can read it from the press as well, of course, but, but there's no hiding that uh, a lot of countries are not, um, are not uh, um, all that comfortable with the term, uh, mine, mine uh, included. But, uh, but these difficult conversations have been good for a reason, and this process of, uh, of uh, strategic uh, uh, compass has been good because now we have we have a paper on the table uh, uh, that I couldn't normally comment on, but since it's been leaked already, uh, uh, I, I can say, and I think uh, I can also reflect. So the mood in the room in general, that countries are happy with it. Uh, and these difficult conversations that we've had ha uh, have led to something very, very useful and have clarified, uh, clarified uh, 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 you know, our, our thinking. And, and I mean, all, although you know, there's things that I'm sure each, each and every one of us would like to change in that document, I mean, it wouldn't, in my personal point of view, wouldn't be all that bad if we signed it like it is today. Um, in terms of the, the technological supremacy issue, I like that question. I think that's, uh, that's one, um, one area where the need for EU-NATO cooperation and EU-US cooperation is as, as, as clear as it can be, because uh, not Euro Europe alone cannot uh, cannot uh, achieve or, 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 or uh, retain technological supremacy, but neither can the U.S. Uh, so this is an area where the U.S. also needs Europe, uh, and uh, and this is this, this is at the end of the day our our advantage because China, uh, you know, what whatever advantages uh, uh, it has. China does not believe in, in alliances. It, it views them as something as something foreign, something that that you know they just don't do it. Uh, mm -hmm. So we need to exploit that to the absolute maximum because this is our main advantage uh, 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 with regard to our adversaries. Thank you, Kadi. Over to you, John. Actually, you know, I've been listening carefully to, to both uh, Tanya and Kadi and having a difficult time identifying aspects that I disagree with, both on, you know, the deeper issues of um, how we should be looking at security uh, and how, what that implies in terms of the way that NATO and the European Union can and should work together, as well as the analysis of where we are at the moment. And, um, you know, I've just been, and I think Kadi was also at the Defence Ministerial meeting in Brussels on Monday and Tuesday, culminating with a, a lunch with, uh, with Jens Stoltenberg uh, yesterday, and between EU Defence Ministers and Jens Stoltenberg. And um, really, the level of convergence is very significant. So then the question that was posed was, you know, so why hasn't everything happened then? Everything is happening, actually, at a remarkable rate. Uh, things do take time, always a little bit more time than we would have liked. But actually, we're coming along very, very well. And uh, what Kadi said about 
the document in its draft stage being something that um, she would already be comfortable with. I think many countries would already. We can improve it, and there's work to be done. And there, uh, in the next three months, uh, a lot will still be um, be, be uh, tweaked in that document. But basically, we've come to a point where we have a substantive uh, document, a significant one, one that uh, forces us to live up to certain commitments and uh, one that can bring everybody on board. And so I think that's remarkable progress, and it's also an excellent basis for uh, strengthening the capacity of the European Union to be a relevant interlocutor uh, for NATO and for dealing with the many of the below the waterline um, issues that are affecting the, you know, our security uh, iceberg, the above the waterline ones being the ones where you can use military instruments for responding. And there are there is so much else which requires us to be looking into the, the much wider toolbox of, of uh, the European Union. On the question of technological autonomy or, or, or sovereignty, this is really about responding to paradigm changes of our age. And uh, I think that you know, the, this word that became so popular during the COVID pandemic, resilience, uh, is, is one that is really going to have to be factored in to our strategic compass. It is already to a strategic uh, concept and above all to our way of operating together as members of a transatlantic community of values. Uh, one in which uh, community where we have to recognize that some of the attachments, some of the ideals that we were attached to uh, regarding, for example, uh, freedom of uh, trade and uh, free markets in all sorts of areas can actually then produce vulnerabilities. And we need to be able to deal with those vulnerabilities. We need to be able to put our security first right. and, and foremost. So this, this is a very significant whole issue area that we are beginning on to, to grasp with. Right, okay. Tanya, I know you want to, to come in, but just because we're, we're fast running out of time. Um, but I want to return again to the, the cartoon we were discussing at the beginning, the Tonu cartoon of the relationship status EU-NATO, um, it's complicated. Judging from what our three speakers have, uh, have said, uh, it's, it seems like it's not complicated at all. And this is a very happy uh, marriage and, and both will live happily ever after. Um, I want all three of you to think ahead. So in 10 years time, what does the relationship between NATO and the EU look like? The title of our session is The Dawn of Multilateralism. Are we really at a dawn? What does midday look like? So sketch the scenario 10 years from now. Tanya, do you want to start with that? Well, you've chosen the right, the wrong person for this because I hate speculating. I refuse <laughs> to answer the question in interviews. Where do you see yourself in five years? I refuse to answer that. Um, but I just, b before going into that, I just wanted to add one sentence to, to complement uh, the Ministry of Defense and to perhaps uh, answer directly one of the questions on threat assessments. I think the EU and NATO very much align on threat assessments. I don't think that is where we need to, to target our efforts. I think that, that is very clear for both sides. Where we need to work together on is to figure out how exactly we will go about in tackling them. So that was, uh, um, that was one sentence just to, to answer the question. Um, I can't speak for, for, for NATO, I think, in, in, in the next 10 years, or I, haven't, I had in a different capacity, so I invite you to read the, the respective report in that sense. But on the EU side, I think, and I know that European defense tends to be very much like a jigsaw, right? All these different puzzle pieces, which not many people can, can put together to form a, a common picture and that we can make sense of. I think that tends to be a bit complicated. But this is where the strategic compass comes in. And I'm really happy to hear uh, all the good feedback that this, uh, this has received. I was also actually in the defense minister's meeting, but just behind the scenes listening to what uh, all of you were saying. Um, but this is really what, what the strategic compass is all about, to set out a common picture, a, strategic, a common strategic vision to help guide us in this future, to, to make sure that it's, uh, that it's not dawn. 
uh, wh when we look uh, to our future. And as I said, it is not a silver bullet. It is not going to f magically fix all the problems that we have, but it is a silver lining, and we, ha we should uh, treat it uh, like that. Thank you, Tanya. Kadi, over to you. The future in 10 years' time. <laughs> Your microphone seems to be on. Sorry, uh, I'd like to use one of the figures that uh, that uh, that uh, uh, Tanya used about the the stray cats that are fighting. So I hope uh, in ten times there's less sort of fighting uh, among the stray cats and more catching mice together. <laughs> okay, great. Zhao, last words from you then. Uh, I think that uh, the mice that I would like to uh, identify. <laughs> Uh, in this are, are really the development of strategic voids as the U.S. shifts its focus to the Pacific. Uh, this is this is a danger that we are facing at the moment, and this is one that the EU has to be able to respond to. As uh, for evident reasons, the U.S. does shift its focus to the Pacific. It's important to remember that, for example, uh, Russia or China are very active in the Mediterranean, in uh, Africa, and, um, and, and other parts of the Atlantic Ocean, and so and the Indian Ocean, Suez, and so on. And we need to be able to, uh, as EU, respond to those strategic voids, which are appearing as there is this tectonic shift of the US towards uh, Asia, the Asia-Pacific region. I'm not optimistic about this happening through the intensification of uh, multilateralism, which is under attack on, on, on all fronts. And the response to that attack, I think, of course, we must, uh, Western countries must seek to defend multilateralism, but we must also uh, generate amongst ourselves the necessary responses for, for the degradation of multilateralism. And I think that these are the kind of responses that will allow us then to, I wouldn't, I, I agree with, with all of the previous speakers who have said that it doesn't make sense to have a division of labor. But on a case by case basis, we need to understand which is the institution most well equipped. And there will, part of that process will be an increasing role for the European Union as a security provider. So, no, I don't think that we'll have, we're at the day, dawn of a new uh, multilateralism, uh, but uh, we have to be at the dawn of a new age of development of. Uh, strategic responses for uh, the provision of security to our peoples. Thank you very much, Zhao. So could we summarize today's session as formerly stray cats catching mice at dawn somewhere in the future? Possibly. Thank you all. Thank, to our, thank you to our three uh, speakers for your excellent contributions. Thank you for your engagement online and also in the room here today. Thank you very much.